Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. I mean, they literally took everything that was there. I don't know. How can they live with themselves? Nothing was left but a pile of rocks. A memorial missing, a mother distraught. Her plea to the public as she tries to honor the memory of her son. Coming up. And it's almost time to hit the pools. The pools, the city plans to open up on Saturday and why it will cost you more to operate your own pool at home. But first, a new reward being offered tonight in hopes of finding the driver who killed a jogger. Crime Stoppers offering up to a $5,000 reward in hopes of finding the driver who killed 53-year-old Lisa Starr Rosenstein. She died Sunday, and several of her closest friends are rallying behind their lost loved one. The night team's Jaffney Gray has a story. She would light up a room like a, like a, a movie star. She was tough as nails on the outside, but on the inside, she was had a heart of gold. 53-year-old Lisa Starr Rosenstein, a highly decorated and passionate runner with 27 marathons under her belt, had a deep impact on the athletic community and those she loved. She loved hard and she loved fast. She was pure magic that you just don't come across real often and she changed a lot of our lives. Her friends say she was unapologetically herself with a great raw sense of humor. Usually twice a day you would see her walking or cooling off on Hebner Road, honk at her and you know sometimes she'd wave and sometimes she would wave with less fingers. <laughs> Two things she loved more than anything in this world, her family and running. She'd do a half marathon a day. Sadly, she took her last run Sunday morning on the Loop 1604 Access Road between Lock Hill Selma and Northwest Military Highway. San Antonio police say Rosenstein was jogging when a four-door sedan hit her, throwing her into a grassy area. A bouquet of flowers now sits in that very spot. The first thing I thought was the brightest light mm -hmm. just went out. I just, I could not... It, it's it's still hard to process. They say though they are heartbroken, they are comforted by this fact. She had done everything that she had wanted to do and she had done it her way. In her honor, they're collecting running shoes to give to those in need. They had this to say to other drivers on the roadways. Just make sure that you just take an extra look for everybody else. It, it would save a lot of heartache. Now, you can find where to drop off those running shoes on our website at ksat.com. The friends say that they're also accepting those shoe donations at her funeral, which is scheduled for tomorrow. In the meantime, San Antonio police needs your help helping finding the driver of that four-door sedan that caused this horrific crime. There's a Crime Stoppers reward. You can call Crime Stoppers. That number is 210-224-STOP. Live at Public Safety Headquarters, Jeffrey Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. An apparent case of road rage sends a delivery driver to the hospital as police search for the driver who shot him. Officers say that driver was confronted as he was pulling up to a warehouse. It happened this afternoon on Macro, that's just north of Loop 410 and Seguin Road. Police say the delivery driver and another driver got into an argument before the suspect pulled out a gun and fired at the driver. The victim able to get into a warehouse and call 911. We have no update on that driver's condition and still no arrests in this case. A mother distraught after she says the memorial she left to remember her son disappeared. Margo Jimenez is the mother of Ricky Delgado, who would have been 31 last month. He died in a crash on Bandera Road near Loop 1604 back in 2019. His mother placed a memorial filled with crosses, notes, and other sentimental items that belonged to Delgado in the spot where he died. She says she drove by the memorial this past Tuesday and saw everything was gone. He was the world to me. I would just ask them to please, even if you don't have to say anything, just put that stuff back in a box and leave it at his memorial. I go there every day, twice a day. Please just bring it back because it means a lot to me and my family. Now a cross, a large cross with purple balloons sits at the crash site. Jimenez says a truck that belonged to her son was also stolen last year. She's filed a police report and is asking anyone with information about the truck or Delgado's missing memorial to contact authorities immediately. The family is offering a reward for the return of both. 
The new tonight, a million dollar home apparently targeted and ransacked the homeowner tied up with electrical cords. Shavano Park Police arresting two men in that robbery. Several more suspects remain on the run tonight. The arrest coming months after the aggravated robbery. Shavano Park Police say the suspects were able to get into the gated community into a home in the Bentley Manor community back in January. Investigators found social media postings involving the robbery along with images of the victim's backyard and a search history for the address, leading them to believe this is a targeted attack. Police arresting 25-year-old Andres Raul Borrego and 28-year-old Deshaun Eugene Powell last week. Officers say both admitted involvement in this case. Three more suspects remain on the run. Investigators say the homeowner tied to a dining room table with electrical cords. He was kicked and slapped. Police said the suspects took $30,000 in cash, several weapons, a watch, and Apple AirPods. An affidavit alleges Borrego and Powell split the cash with the other suspects involved. The migrant shelter at Freeman Coliseum is expected to stop housing unaccompanied teen boys in about four weeks. The contract to lease out the Expo Hall ends on May 30th. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf says there's been no evidence to back up the sexual assault allegations that Governor Greg Abbott announced last month. Judge Wolf also said more than 1,500 teens remain at the shelter as of yesterday. 30 teens were sent to a licensed care facility. Judge Wolf says teens were also matched with 487 sponsors following background checks. Another 77 teens have aged out of the system. Judge Wolf says the three teens who escaped the shelter last month have not been found. A metro disaster. It's already led to dozens of deaths. The train collapse in Mexico City also cutting off transportation. And now there are concerns of a greater impact on the metro system. Officials in Mexico City say a concrete overpass support beam gave way right there. You see it as the packed train passed over it nearly 24 hours ago. Hundreds of buses called in to help people get to work and other destinations, but it's unclear how long that could last. Former KSAT reporter and now CNN correspondent Matt Rivers is in Mexico covering this story. He says concerns are growing among residents and metro workers. But the union that represents a lot of the workers uh, that work for the, the metro system here, uh, they say that thousands of metro workers might go on strike as soon as tomorrow uh, to protest what they're calling unsafe conditions. We're going to have to wait and see how exactly that plays out, but it's certainly something that could cripple this system. The train collapse claimed the lives of 24 people, including children. Another 27 remain in the hospital tonight. This collapse happened on line number 12, which opened less than 10 years ago in Mexico City. Residents raised safety concerns after seeing cracks in the structure following an earthquake in 2017. Mexico's president promising a thorough and transparent investigation. Now to an update on coronavirus cases here at home. 165 new cases were confirmed today along with one new death. More than 3,300 people have died in Bear County since the pandemic began. Over in our hospitals, 223 COVID-19 patients are hospitalized, 71 are in the intensive care unit, and 42 are on ventilators. The popular rental assistance program created amid this pandemic still has funding. City staff believe they will have enough money to keep helping San Antonio residents into September. More than 34,000 households were able to pay their rent or mortgage and other bills with help from this program. The program also includes county funds for residents outside city limits. The city recently raised the limit on assistance to up to nine months worth of help for people who meet the income criteria. But the program isn't without its issues with landlords who want to evict tenants. City staff says they have had to reach out to recipients and tell them not to move out because their applications are still being processed. Residents also still have some protection against eviction for non-payment or rent because of a CDC moratorium, which expires on June 30th. Little change in pace today, a quieter day and not as hot in the afternoon. Yesterday we were well into the 90s today, mid 80s, which is average for this time of year. Right now we're sitting pretty at 73 at the airport in town, Castroville 74, Uvalde 73, and we have some 60s up in the hill country, even comfort now at 63. Tomorrow morning, 
We'll be running a little below average. Widespread mid to upper 50s. 57 in Hondo in the morning. Helotus 57. Bulverde about 55. And Poteet a morning temperature of 59. We're going to be back to talk about how much longer this lack of humidity sticks around and some statistics regarding the aquifer and the recent rainfall coming right up. We're going to take you some breaking news right now. Police are responding to a shooting on Guadalupe and South Hamilton. This is on the city's west side. As you can tell, it is a very active scene right now. Yeah, we don't have a lot of details as of right now. We can just tell you that it did come across as a shooting again on the west side. You see a number of units there on scene responding, including uh, fire, EMS and police at this hour. This is kind of a busy area on the west side, Guadalupe Street, uh, a very um, uh, high, high density there in this area. So again, we don't know what's happening, but uh, we can tell you it's a shooting. We do have a crew on the way and hope to learn more here in the next few minutes. Yeah, it looks like a store of some sort on the corner. Not sure if it happened at the residents that are also there or at that store. As we said, we're continuing to monitor it. This is a live picture from Sky 12. You still head on the night beat. The city of San Antonio is set to open up several of its pools. The location set to welcome swimmers this weekend and how they are limiting capacity. Plus our own Patty Santos tracking a potential issue for pool owners at home. The fun in the pool this summer is looking a little more expensive. I'll explain why coming up next. And the Biden administration setting a new goal in the vaccine rollout, how they hope to speed up the process coming up next. Our goal by July 4th is to have 70 percent of adult Americans at least one shot and 160 million Americans fully vaccinated. President Joe Biden announcing a new goal in the effort to get all Americans vaccinated against COVID-19. The Biden administration set to direct federal pharmacy partners to begin to provide walk-in hours so people may receive the vaccine without an appointment. If the U.S. does not meet 80% herd immunity, one FDA advisor warns the nation could be in store for another winter surge of coronavirus. The next focus is to get children between the ages of 12 and 15 vaccinated. The FDA is reviewing the Pfizer vaccine for that age range with the decision likely next week. A well, pool fund this summer could cost you twice as much. Limited chlorine supplies mean a rise in prices for pool owners and operators. And some are hesitant to say there's a shortage at the moment, saying it will depend on what actions we all take next. One businessman tells the night team's Patty Santos why the key is to remain calm. There was really no toilet paper shortage. There was no paper towel shortage. We created it. Uh, we, we panicked uh, and we bought way too much. Brian Phibbs trying to head off any talk of a shortage in pool sanitizing supplies. Those in the pool business have known about the limited chlorine stock since last August, but now that summer weather is around the corner, pool owners have gotten wind of it. Since this has come up, I've had three clients call us about out, out, you know, possible shortage. A fire and hurricane shut down one of the few chemical plants that produces the pool sanitizing chemical, causing strain on production. So we'll have enough chlorine for our customers and our, and our clients, uh, but it is, uh, you're going to pay more this year. There's no doubt about that. Prices for tablets, granular and liquid chlorine have skyrocketed, says Andre Montwell. A normal bucket like that, we would sell for $43. You know, now it's $79.99. But before you go out hoarding chlorine pool tablets, do a little research and maybe consider other options. There's also some alternatives where if you want to get away from the tablets, you can move into salt cells, uh, which will produce your own chlorine uh, in your pool. But, you know, that's a $2,500, $3,000 investment. Brian warns people hoarding supplies could create a real shortage and cause prices to keep climbing. There's definitely less than there usually is this time of year, er, er, but there, there's still enough to go around. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. It is also worth mentioning the city plans to open six outdoor pools beginning this weekend. Check out the list. The pools at Woodlawn, Southside Lions, Heritage and Lady Bird Johnson will open Saturday and Sunday from 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. They will also be open Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. 8 p.m. 
The San Pedro Springs and John F. Kennedy pools will be open on Saturdays and Sundays from 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. In order to limit capacity, pre-registration will be required along with COVID screenings. We have the full list of protocols on KSAT.com. Oh, I know my kids are ready for pool weather, me not so much. It kind of snuck up on me yeah. that they're opening city pools this Already. weekend. Hopped in the neighborhood pool last weekend. You know, it's one of those, once you're in, you feel okay, but it definitely yeah. still has a chill to it. When I tell the kids, hey, by August, you'll be begging for this water. So very true. try to savor it while well, you can or something. Anyway, uh, less wind tonight. The wind has subsided, so that gusty wind, it's out of here for now. We have a cooler morning tomorrow, actually running a little below average. We touched on that earlier. Most of us mid to upper 50s in the morning. And let's go over some rainfall and aquifer stats from the recent thunderstorm activity that we've had in this active weather pattern. Uh, the San Antonio International Airport has seen over seven inches of rain since Wednesday. Bear County in general, between about five and 10, depending on where you're located. The aquifer is up 15.7 feet in one week. Look at the aquifer since February. Of course, we had the winter freeze and the snow, that storm situation. Then we recovered and then April pumping season into May. We really tanked and bottomed out. All it took was this one basically five day period to really gain a lot of ground. I do want to point out we still are in stage two watering restrictions, according to saws and when and if that changes will definitely let you know. I want to go back to this really quickly. Rainfall estimates over the past seven days fairly impressive across South Texas, but especially in and around parts of Bear County. You see these purples indicating eight to nine plus inches of rainfall, and this is just estimated by the Doppler radar, but it, it, they, these numbers really do jive well with some of the rain gauges out there in folks neighborhoods. So the active weather, it's all out of here. The severe weather is in the southeast United States today and moving across the deep south. Our rain chances aren't back in the picture until Sunday, Mother's Day, and then into next week. And it's really just that isolated pop-up thunderstorm activity that we could see. Until then, lack of humidity and sunny skies. 73 right now, dew point of only 54. We're 78 in Catula. Laredo 81, those are the warmer locations. 60s now in the hill country. And tomorrow, as I mentioned, we'll start today mid to upper 50s. Sunny, 83 by the afternoon. Low humidity all day and a light northeasterly breeze at 5 to 15. Down toward Catula, Carrizo Springs, Pierce Aldilla, you could break 90 degrees, but elsewhere, mostly in the 80s and I think even 70s for highs up in the hill country, upper 70s that is. The humidity, it's back by the weekend, so a lack of humidity up until Saturday and especially Mother's Day. It's going to be sticky and muggy outside. Temperatures get back into the low 90s at the same time by Sunday. All right, thank you so much, Adam. We'll be ready for the pools mm -hmm. this weekend. <laughs> All right, so the Spurs lose badly to Utah. Their reward, they get to play them again. <laughs> yes, and the question is, do these many series that have resulted of the COVID-19 pandemic help younger players that the Spurs have get ready for the playoffs? When we come back, we'll ask that question. Also, the Houston Texans made Davis Mills their number one draft pick because he's a quarterback. Should Deshaun Watson not be able to play to start the season? Is he ready to start when we come back? All right, San Antonio Spurs will have to do it again tomorrow after they got lit up by the best of the West. The Utah Jazz last night in Salt Lake City. That's after playing the beast of the East, the Philadelphia 76ers, to overtime the night before. As a result, the Spurs have dropped a 10th in the Western Conference, but still in contention for the play-in tournament. Started off with an awful first half where the Spurs could not hit a three-pointer, thanks in part of the Jazz' excellent perimeter defense led by Rudy Gobert, who had 24 points and 15 rebounds, even though the Jazz were actually led in scoring by Boyan Bogdanovich, who had 25 points. The Spurs went 0 for seven in the first half from long range and wound up being down 60 to 43 at the break. The Spurs would play a much better second half led by DeMar DeRozan at 22. Rudy Gay was 17, but the Spurs still fall for the fourth straight time, 110 to 99. Second half was like night and day, you know, in the first. Um, you know, it took us a little while, you know, from travel and having a pretty emotional game last night. Uh, but, uh, you know, we still fought. We fought, and um, not guys are young, but they're, they're learning, and, you know, we're going to have to continue to, to, to learn and get, get stronger, get faster. 
You know, with a win last night, the Utah Jazz are now the top team in the NBA with a record of 47 and 18 and a legitimate threat to win it all this season. And now the Spurs must face him again tomorrow in Salt Lake City. Spurs were asked following that last loss last night if these mini series during the regular season helps prepare young players in silver and black for the playoffs. I mean, every day you step, you know, uh, into the facility or the gym or just around this being a professional is good for them because uh, they get to learn. And even myself, uh, you know, I'm not perfect. Uh, I might be a little ahead because I've been here more than them. But, you know, we all could learn from each other. We all could learn from mistakes, uh, you know, and we all could get better. So, you know, myself, I'm going to continue to lead by example and uh, try to help every single one of them. And, you know, they can help me with things, too, by watching if they see something. So, you know, it's a it's a thing that you got to do together. They will do it again tomorrow, albeit an hour earlier at 8 p.m. in Salt Lake. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys will not pick up the fifth year option on linebacker Leighton Vander Esch. That was first reported by Vander Esch's agent, Ron Slavin. The option in 2022 would have guaranteed Vander Esch $9.1 million, even though the Cowboys do want Vander Esch back just at a reduced rate. The reason? His durability. After making Vander Esch a first round draft pick in 2018, he played in every single game of his rookie season, starting 11, was even named at the Pro Bowl. But since his first year, he has missed 13 games. Next surgery in 2019. 19 followed up by a broken collarbone and by drafting Micah Parsons with the 10th overall pick the Cowboys can be a little picky at that linebacker position Cowboys Vice President Stephen Jones confirmed the move during his appearance on a Dallas radio station that's uh, accurate I will say that of our intentions are to keep uh, Leighton around here for the next four or five years we've just got uh, you know obviously some unknowns uh, not unlike Chan Lee Leighton's had some bad luck with uh, injuries uh, that we were able to work through with Sean. And then, of course, not knowing what our cap situation is going to be uh, next year, you know, where the league's going to peg the cap, how all this is going to work out. We just uh, felt like, uh, you know, unfortunately we needed, needed to do this. Now, what would happen if the Houston Texans had to kick off their 2021 season without their star quarterback, Deshaun Watson, next? Even though the Houston Texans didn't have a first or second round pick, they used their first pick in the third round to select Stanford quarterback Davis Mills. That sent a clear message throughout the league that new general manager Nick Casario is worried about the availability of star quarterback Deshaun Watson, who's facing no less than 22 civil lawsuits for women who claim sexual assault and inappropriate conduct during massages. Mills head coach at Stanford, David Shaw, believes he's ready to start in the NFL. What does Mills think? First thing, um, I mean, obviously I can't do it from the start, but I think my leadership ability is up there. Obviously, you got to get in front of some of my teammates and start building their respect by putting in hard work. And then the next thing, just that winning mentality and that um, ability on the field. And can't wait to get out there with the other guys on the team. All right, but many question his lack of college experience, where he only started 11 games for the Cardinal, finishing with over 3,400 yards passing, 14 total appearances, and 18 touchdowns and eight interceptions. Houston Astros return to Yankee Stadium in front of fans for the first time since the cheating scandal broke, opening up a three-game series against the Yankees tonight. That did not go over well with the Yankees, by the way. Top of the first, Alex Bregman helping the cause of the 410-foot blast to left center, giving Houston an early one-run edge. Top of the fourth now, Astros down 3-1. to one. Astros Michael Brantley putting this ball into the seats in right field. The solo shot cuts the Yankees lead down to one. Three batters later, Yuli Gurriel rips the double down left field line that plates Jordan Alvarez, and the game is tied at three, but the Astros run out of gas. The Yankees score four runs in the six, and Houston falls seven to three. As you can see, there is a collision at the play. That is tough on catchers. All right, let's take a look at the score for the first game of the season for San Antonio Missions back in double A, and in the ninth, they're up six to three. So baseball is back in San Antonio, starting with their home opener coming up later this month. And the missions are going undefeated this year. Yes, they are. Yeah. <laughs> Hold you to it. We'll be right back. <laughs> I want to get back to that breaking news we brought you at the top of the newscast. We have learned the shooting that police responded to was in front of a convenience store near Guadalupe and South Hamilton. Yeah, police say one man was sitting in front of that store when he was shot in the leg. That man was taken to the hospital. He is expected to be okay. No word on any arrests. You can see that fire and EMS are on the scene. Of course, we'll have the very latest on Good Morning San Antonio at 4.30 a.m. Good night.